Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Mason Toms, and I work for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, which is a division of the Department of Arkansas Heritage. Thank you for coming, and welcome to the Herb D Daniel House. Today's tour is worth one hour of AIA continuing education credit. If you are interested in that, please see me or Callie Williams, who's standing over to my left. Um, after, the t after I get done talking, uh, we have a small thing we need to do to fill out while you're here. Uh, the Herb Daniel House, which was completed in 1965, uh, the main house was, uh, is an a unique example of Frank Lloyd Wright's organic modern architecture designed by Frank Dowdy, uh, built in North Little Rock. Uh, North Little Rock originally started off as the town of Argenta and was platted in 1866 on the north shore of the Arkansas River by Thomas Newton Sr. The name Argenta was derived from the Latin for silver, Argentum which was a reference to the Kellogg lead and silver mines that are located, were located about 10 miles north of town at the time, um, now just off the end of uh, JFK and Sherwood. In the 1880s, Argenta was actually closer to a frontier settlement than a twin city to the state's capital. The intersection of several major railroads and the mills and factories which accompanied them brought um, numerous workers to the area, but they were kind of a rougher sort. And there was no official governance in the city uh, in the beginning, which led to a, law, a reputation of lawlessness and immorality. During this time, it's when, uh, this is when a lot of people say that the name Dogtown was first created in reference to North Little Rock, which kind of referenced the working class and their poor behavior. Others say the term was actually created when North Little Rock officially came into existence. It was part of an elaborate scheme by William Fawcett to gain control of Argenta from Little Rock which had annexed Argenta as its eighth ward in 1890 without giving the residents of Argenta a voice in the matter. Step one in his plan was completed in 1901 when Fawcett crafted the Walnut Ridge Hoxie Bill and introduced it into state legislature. This bill allowed any two towns within a mile of each other to merge if agreed upon by popular vote um, within the town. The problem was that the Little Rock supporters of the bill were not aware of the statewide implications. They thought it just applied to Walnut Ridge and Hoxie in northeast Arkansas. So after the bill passed, um, Argenta was annexed, in, uh, a town of North, North Little Rock, a new town of North Little Rock was created just north of Argenta in 1901. And after the bill was passed, Argenta and North Little Rock voted to merge themselves together and did, um, which created what we now call uh, North Little Rock. In 1906, they changed their name back to Argenta, but it was eventually changed back to North Little Rock in 1917. Uh, but the story goes that, North, that Little Rock was none too pleased when Argenta got stolen from it, and so they would commonly release their stray dogs uh, into the area across the river, which, caused, which created the name Dogtown. However, there's no real evidence, concrete evidence, to support either one of the stories, but they do make good stories. All the best stories don't have evidence to support them. Um, what we do know for certain, though, about North Little Rock is that its growth in the early 20th century uh, mainly tended to go towards the north. This is because to the west they had Big Rock, uh, which kind of stopped the growth that way, and to the east they had a very marshy area that's now called Dark Hollow, which is mostly underwater right now, so still marshy. In 1921, Justin Matthews plotted a new development on the hill above uh, above North Little Rock called Park Hill. Park Hill was North Little Rock's first suburban development, and the sale of the properties began as well as early as 1922. The paving of the Arkmo Highway, now called JFK Boulevard, in 1927 allowed for easy access to Park Hill from downtown Little Rock and made the area very desirable. It was actually marketed as a second Plasky Heights, but with all the, all the advantages of Plasky Heights, but um, far more convenience because it was actually technically closer to downtown. By the early 30s, Park Hill boasted over 245 buildings, but the Great Depression pretty much brought all that development to a halt. Around 1940, when the area had sufficiently recovered from the Great Depression, construction in Park Hill began again. Um, as before, the development of the area proceeded from south to north. It grew from its southern beginnings from the edge of the ridge to the north. Um, and it, during this period, from about 1940 to 1950, roughly 236 structures were built in the area. Though Park Hill, the original development, was mainly known for its uh, craftsmen and Spanish eclectic style homes, the later built sections of development embraced a wide variety of architectural styles, including colonial revival, minimal traditional, and even ranch houses. 
The homes alongside water, uh, the homes along Waterside, and its feeder streets, which is where we are now, were among the last houses built in the Park Hill development, which explains why they look so different from the homes that you might most often associate with Park Hill. Um, because these homes uh, have so many similar architectural elements and designs as the nearby Lakewood development, and because they were built at the same time as Lakewood, a lot of people actually think this is part of Lakewood, but technically it's actually Park Hill. Uh, this area also boasts several example, great examples of mid-century modern architecture in addition to the Daniel House. In fact, there were two homes built here that were designed as the personal re residences of architects, uh, fairly prominent architects during the time. One is just two doors down. It was built by Bob Millett. It was his first house he built here. And his daughter uh, recently restored it. Um, and it's a gorgeous house. Um, but the fact that the architects were actually building their houses here also points to the fact that Park Hill continued to be one of the most fashionable areas to live um, even into the 60s. However, it was mainly the scenic beauty of the area that drew most of the residents, and this includes Irvin and Elizabeth Daniel. Irvin S. Daniel, most commonly called Irv, was born in 1923 to parents Starling Edgar Daniel and Annie Mae Irvin Daniel. The Daniels came to Arkansas from Texas in the early 1920s, and according to the family, the couple chose Arkansas because his family was in Texas and her family was in Tennessee, so they just picked the halfway point. Initially, the Daniels moved to Heber Springs, where Starling <coughs> tried his hand at being a farmer. However, this didn't really pan out well for him. As he later said, all you can grow in Heber Springs is rocks. <laughs> this led him to enter into the printing business around 1930. In 1934, the Daniel family, uh, 1934 when Irvin was two, the Daniel family moved to North Little Rock after a short stint in Little Rock. They lived in a house on Lincoln oh, Avenue and owned a little commercial building across the street where Sterling ran his printing business. Irvin attended North Little Rock schools and graduated from North Little Rock High School in 1949. He went on to attend a college at Little Rock Junior College, which is now UALR, for a year and a half before the Korean War interrupted his education. He served in the Army for two years, but didn't really see a ton of traditional action, what you think of with the Korean War, because he was stationed in Europe. He achieved the rank of corporal before his enlistment was complete, and afterwards he began attending classes at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, where he studied business. It was during his time at the university that he met the future architect of his house, Frank Dowdy. Urban graduated from the University of Arkansas in 1955, and decided to return to Central Arkansas afterwards. His first job was at the former SO service station at the foot of Cantrell Hill. However, while Irv was under the impression that he was part of a three-month management training program, in the eyes of the company, he was really just there to pump gas. Uh, this led him to seek employment, uh, employment elsewhere when their scheme was exposed. Later, Irv went to work as a salesman for International Harvester Company, some of you may remember them, who had their regional offices on East 2nd Street in Little Rock. However, this position didn't last too long either. In 1957, Irv's father asked him to come help out with the family printing company, which Irvin, of course, agreed to. Daniel, a label printing company, has always been a family operation from its creation in 1930. However, it was always a rather small operation. This all changed, though, after Irvin began working there. He had heard about a new printing process created in St. Louis called flexography. This new type of printing allowed the user to continuously print designs onto spooled rows, rolls of material which was far faster than the standard offset printing of the time. The machines at that time were actually relatively small in comparison to their modern counterparts, so much so that in 1957, Irvin was able to drive up to St. Louis, purchase one, and bring it back in the trunk of his Plymouth. <laughs> the purchase of the new printer allowed the company to take on bigger clients and more of them. Their one of their first big clients was the Myers Bakery of Little Rock, made famous by their brown and serve rolls, which were started to be marketed in the, during the Depression. The label, uh, Daniel Label Printing Company continued to grow over the next several years to become one of the biggest names in the industry. A year after Irv checked up to St. Louis to retrieve the flexographic printer, he married the love of his life, Elizabeth Angelina Farrell. The couple would soon start a family, and that family grew to include two boys and two girls, all of which lived in a little two-bedroom house on Lincoln Avenue near his parents. Before too long, it became painfully obvious that a new house was needed. Irvin and Elizabeth found the perfect piece of property on the northern edge of the Park Hill development in North Little Rock. The, company, the couple fell in love with the beautiful setting, but Irv refused to pay more than $1,200 for the lot. Elizabeth promptly relayed this information to the realtor, 
who told the seller, and the seller, to Herb's surprise, agreed. Um, all that was left for them to do was come up with a design, one that would satisfy their needs while accenting the natural beauty of the site. As Irv said, he always knew that he couldn't live in a regular house. Though Irv had grown up with architects, uh, grown up with several talented architects, including Herman Lee and Kit Moore, there was only one person he could envision designing his dream home, and that was Frank Dowdy. The house took about a year to build and cost thirty thousand dollars initially. Um, about 1968, after, fir after several requests from his family, Irv decided to install air conditioning and also built the carport, <laughs> which was also designed by Dowdy from the beginning. Uh, these projects, along with a few other things, brought the grand total to the for the construction of the house to around $50,000. The Daniels raised their four children in the house and now welcome grandchildren and even great-grandchildren into it. Irvin said that he couldn't imagine living anywhere else. The architect of your house, as I said, was Frank Dowdy. Frank Lorenzo Dowdy was born on June 21st, 1930, in Memphis, Tennessee. Though his family owned a large plantation outside of Tunica, Mississippi, Frank said they were by no means wealthy. It was during his childhood in Tunica that he first took an interest in architecture. Though Frank in often enjoyed building model trains and planes, it was not until 1942, when he watched the erection of the Tunica Methodist Church as a teenager, that he became interested in how buildings were built and designed. A few years later, his family moved for a brief period to Robinson, Illinois, but eventually settled in Stuttgart, Arkansas, where he spent his senior year of high school and eventually graduated. His move to Stuttgart was actually a very fortuitous one for him, though, because that is where he met his future wife, Suzanne Burkle. After Frank graduated from high school in 1948, an interest in art led him to enroll in the Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida. However, like Urban, his time at the art school was cut short by the outbreak of the Korean War. Frank enlisted in the Air Force and was stationed at Mountain Home Air Force Base in Mountain Home, Idaho, where he spent the entire war. He joked that the Koreans were a little light on the ground in Idaho, so we didn't really see much of them during the war. <laughs> um, during his time he was, that he was stationed there, he was actually part of a psychological war unit uh, that, unknown to him until later, was essentially a CIA black ops site. Uh, Frank remarked that he thought the exercises they were doing seemed awfully odd, but he was just doing what he was told. To make extra money on the side, Frank worked with a, a more colorful group of people. One job he kind of fell into was painting icons onto slot machine reels for a local businessman, because Idaho had actually banned the importation of, of slot machine parts in an effort to do away with gambling altogether. So this guy would have him redo the sequence of uh, fruit and bars and stuff on the slot machine. His other side job was painting murals on the back bars of local drinking establishments. He said that that job didn't really pay much, but they'd give him free beer while he was working, so it was a win-win. <laughs> in the mid-1930s, uh, in the mid 1930 or 1953, Frank was offered $300 to be discharged early from the Air Force, an offer he took, and after which moved back to Arkansas. Using the GI Bill, he started taking classes at Little Rock Junior College, but he had heard about a newly created architecture program at the University of Arkansas, so he made a call and made, a, he called and made an appointment with the program's founder, John G. Williams, um, to meet with him. After his meeting, uh, he was so impressed by Williams that Frank said that he, had to, he knew that he had to immediately enroll in the program to study under him. Frank was a quick study and proved to be more than adept at architectural design, finishing his architectural education at the top of his class. Frank's design talent led Williams to send him off to work in the offices of the internationally renowned Arkansas native Edward Durrell Stone for two years after he completed his coursework in 1958, an honor that Williams reserved only for his best and brightest pupils. His reputation of creating beautiful, skillful rendered perspectives preceded him. Because of this, Frank mainly worked on renderings for high-profile projects instead of working on the designs themselves. Some of the more uh, significant projects that Frank worked on while in Stone's office was a design, a proposed design for the National Presbyterian Church in DC, which in ultimately didn't get built. Uh, but he also worked on the uh, World Trade Center in New Orleans, uh, which did get built in 1959, and the initial designs for the National Cultural Center in D DC, which eventually became the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. While Frank admits that he learned a great deal about architecture and how it was practiced in the professional world at Stone's office, New York life did not agree with his laid-back character. The hectic hustle and bustle of the Big Apple made Frank long for the quiet calm of the rural countryside of his youth. In 1960, he returned, decided to return to Arkansas where he and Suzanne were finally married, 
and where he eventually went to work for renowned Ozark modernist E. Faye Jones. Jones knew Frank from his time at the architecture, in the architecture program at the university, where Jones had taught since his return to Arkansas in 1953. When Frank inquired about a possible position, Jones leapt at the opportunity to have someone of Frank's talent in his office. Once there, Frank was given the opportunity to actually do a great deal of design, unlike in Stone's office. According to sources, Frank was generally given a great deal of free reign on all the projects he designed. And over the next four years, Frank would work on some of the most influential designs produced by the firm during the period. Some of these projects included the Glenn and Alma Parsons House in Springdale, Arkansas, which was started in 1961, finished in 65. The Shahid Goodfellow Weekend Cottage, better known as Stoneflower, in Heber Springs in 1963. The Underwood Building in Fayetteville, uh, which was done in 1966. And the Orville and Alta Fabas House in Huntsville, which was completed in 1967. However, despite the opportunities to work on large-scale commissions in his home state, Frank decided it was time to make a name for himself on his own. In 1965, uh, he left the Jones firm and moved to central Arkansas in order to sit for his architectural licensing exams. Unfortunately, Frank got the dates wrong on the exam and ended up having to stay longer in central Arkansas than he meant to. However, Frank's extended stay was lucky for us because this was his most productive period during his career in Arkansas. Between 1964 and 1967, Frank received commissions uh, for six buildings, uh, which is over half of his total body of work in Arkansas. Two of these commissions were in Carlisle, one in Brinkley, one in Goodwin, one in Little Rock, and a single house in North Little Rock, this one. Frank's design, uh, the designs Frank produced during this period exhibited a more solidified sets of elements and architectural forms by an architect who was coming into his own. Um, and this is when he created this house. Frank did eventually sit him for his licensing exams, and not surprisingly, he passed. And around 1967, he and his wife moved to Boca Raton, Florida, where he had lived when he was younger for a short period, to open a small practice. Even though the practice was relatively successful and Frank won awards for several designs he produced at the time, it turned out that Frank's passion for architectural design did not extend to the tedious and mundane tasks of operating his own firm. He was wonderful at creating detailed drawings and breathtaking renderings, but was not so good at billing clients or following up to make sure invoices were paid. So in 1971, Frank decided to close his practice and he and Suzanne returned to Fayetteville, where he took a position teaching at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. He retired from teaching in 1993 after 23 years of instructing and inspiring young architects. Um, the design for when Frank designed, or not, yeah, when Frank designed this house, he was met with a unique challenge because of the steep sloping side, which required someone of great deal of imagination and talent. <laughs> Urban knew that Frank would be up to the task, and Frank designed the house in 1964, and it was completed. The main house was completed in 1965. Frank's design for the Daniel House is an example of Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architecture. And we can see this because of the because, because of the design embraces the landscape by sinking the house into the hillside instead of carving a flat area out for the house to be built on. Additionally, by staining the exterior uh, wood board and batten siding black and contrasting it with a rusty brick, it helped the house to blend into the landscape, whereas so that the house itself kind of blends with the trees the, and the uh, uh, the brick mimics rock croppings, and as such, it kind of becomes part of the landscape. Frank brought nature into the house by turning the plan of the house at an angle, so two full sides of the lower level were exposed, allowing for ample natural light and views from these areas. The upper level was given cantilevered balconies on two sides, which takes full advantage of the view, and with the other two sides being at ground level. In a move that echoed many of Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie style designs, Frank placed the entrance so that it faced the parking area and not the street, allowing visitors to discover the property more as they meandered up to the door, which is up these stairs and around. So instead of putting the door on this side, he put it all way, not facing the street, which Wright called the hidden entrance. The exterior architecture of the house seems to echo um, one of Frank Lloyd Wright's final projects, though, the 1957 Marshall Urban Prefab House No. 2. Marshall Urban & Associates was a company based out of Wisconsin that began selling a line of prefabricated homes in 1953 called U Foreman. In 1954, Wright approached them about designing a new, home, new homes for them that would not only be better designed, but cost half as much to build, in theory. And if you know anything about Frank Lloyd Wright, his cost estimates were never right. 
Eventually, Wright created three different house plans, which were aptly named Urban Prefab Houses 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> Only nine houses out of the series were ever built. Uh, one, plan number one being the most popular, with seven of them being built. Only two versions of plan number two were built, uh, but unfortunately no plan number threes were built at all. Like the Daniel House, the plan for the urban prefab house number two was essentially square, with a central fireplace and chimney. The plan also featured a room, uh, living room that enjoyed two full walls of glass, like the Daniel House, while the while the four plans of, of the prefab house number two and the Daniel house are similar in many ways, it seems that Frank actually took most of his inspiration for the interior layout of the house from Faye Jones' own house in Fayetteville, which he built in 1953 when he returned from Oklahoma. Like the Daniel house, the main living spaces are on the upper level of, of the Jones house, with the master bedroom being separated from the public room by only a fireplace and a low couch. Also in both houses, the children's rooms were placed in the lower level which was meant to give the children their own space away from the adults, which didn't always work because the children just had come upstairs. <laughs> Another place we see the Jones influence was also in the uh, balcony railing design, which was, which was inspired by the railing on the Jones house and was a common feature in uh, Frank's other designs. However, taken as a whole, the Daniel house was a unique, is a unique example of the mid-century modern organic architecture in Arkansas in that it took elements from different houses but combined them in a wholly unique way. Um, and in the house, when we go in in a few minutes, you can see kind of how these layouts, we'll, we'll have these plans out here so you can look at them before you go in. I will say when we go in the house, uh, you're free to explore it, but the staircase is on kind of narrow. So when you go upstairs, if you're able, there, um, when you go upstairs, please go out the kitchen door and wrap around the property. Um, the ground is well enough to walk on, um, just to kind of relieve some congestion. Um, but you'll see a lot, of, it's really similar on the second floor of what, um, what the Jones house is like. And the main reason, you're probably wondering why would you put the main living space on the second floor to begin with. It was just to take uh, advantage of the views. The first floor has nice views, the second floor has better views. Um, so it's a much more open space. Also, when you go in, when you're going up the stairs, first start going up the stairs, look behind you, there's a small tile above the stairs. Um, and that was uh, Frank's signature. He put them in all of his houses. This is the only one of his houses that still has, well, other than his own house, um, that still has the tile. And if you look at it, it's a stylized design of Frank's initials, FDL. Um, and it's, it's a really nice touch. He actually got the idea from Frank Lloyd Wright, who always did little tiles with his name on it, and installed it all of his properties. Um, it, does anybody have any questions about the house before you go inside? Yes, Jim. Um, I wonder about the closet underneath the balcony. Uh, is that original? Uh, does it match the other uh, soffits? Uh, Frank did have the balcony rebuilt, um, but doing a corrugated um, doing a corrugated ceiling under a balcony was actually a mid-century thing. So I don't know how much the material is original or not. Um, one of one thing I did mention, but I'll tell the story now just because everyone's out here. If you notice, the carport has kind of its back cut off uh, when you're coming up. That's because when the house was built, the contractor built this upper terrace too deep. And so the carport was offset when they tried to build it. Well, it's right up against the property line. So they had to, Frank had to redesign the back corner of the carport so it didn't cross over the property line into the next yard. <laughs> Thank you.